I'm going on now. Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. I don't think it takes that long. That's why I preloaded everything. And once we hit the thing, we should be good to go. We're good. Why don't you get started? Okay. We just go. Oh, well, actually, we're two minutes early. Yeah. <laughs> so, <what do> you <laughs> think? Two minutes early. Black people, two minutes early. Oh, my God. We're going to shock some people. Huh? Huh? Let's start <laughs> a revolution, sh man. Shock some people. Let's see how many people we got on. If you are on live with us, first, we want to thank you for being here this evening. This is a special evening. So, let me just get the housekeeping out of the way. We want you to love this page. We want you to like this page. But most importantly, we want you to share with everyone you can. Let them know that we are live with our Power Podcast live stream series. Uh, and tonight is a very special night. We are on with the one and only Dr. George C. Frazier and Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. And so we're ready to get going. What I need for you to do is to let us know where you're from. Uh, the same place that you're typing in at the bottom, I'll get your questions from there a little bit later on, but let us know where you're from, if you can hear us, if you can see us. Again, share the link with everyone, and I'm going to go over just to see if we're getting some activity with the link or with the chat roll real quick. Just let me know that you can hear me. It looks like we got around 68 people. I see someone from London checking in. Hmm. Well, Southern Dennis PA. Kimball, George, you pack them in, Dennis, man. You bring them in, bro. Okay, it's Dennis here Kimball, we go, man. <laughs> Ain't Boy. no social distancing with you, man. You pack them in. <laughs> <laughs> we even got Ghana. Someone from Ghana who's originally here from Atlanta. So we welcome you. We got Lake Ridge, Virginia, Ohio, Texas, Mississippi, Georgia, Kentucky, New York, Indiana, Richmond, Norfolk. So everybody from all over the country, LA, Chicago is checking in. So once again, we want to thank you for being with us this evening. Again, housekeeping rules. Please love this page. Like this page but share this page. Invite your family and friends right now because we're going live with our Power Podcast live stream series. And we have with us right now, the one and only Dr. George C. Frazier and the one and only <laughs> Dr. Dennis mm -hmm. Embro. We got two one of a kind. You won't find anyone like these two men. <laughs> on the two one and only. Yeah, two, 800 <laughs> years between us, George. <laughs> 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 this is awesome, man. So look, let's get going. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, if this is your first time here, my name is Brother Bedford, and I'm the founder of the Master Business Network and Mastermind, which is an online network and mastermind community. And that inspiration hit me from really following the two men that we're about to hear from this evening. This is a very special night for me. I really don't need to uh, read a bio or anything to introduce George, then George, Dr. Frazier will take us further into the program. But I do just want to say one or two words before I hand it over to Dr. Frazier. Now, my journey started years ago uh, in this space of entrepreneurship and business, and I was recommended two books to get started. Those two books were Success Runs in Our Race by Dr. George C. Frazier and Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice by Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. Now, fast forward after I read those two books and I got started on my journey and I started my first online product or project, I said that I needed to interview them. There was a book out called Conversations with Millionaires that only had one Black person in it. And that was Famous Amos, Wallace Famous Amos from Famous Amos Cookies. And I said, wouldn't it be great if someone could interview some of our giants and put that into an ebook. Now I was already studying success runs in our race and I was studying Think and Grow Rich of Black Choice. And I said, well, let me give it a shot. And the first interview that I got 
was with Dr. George C. Frazier. I called down to Cleveland, Ohio, and he granted me an interview. The second interview I got was when I called down to Atlanta, Georgia, and I was granted the interview with Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. So these two men have been very instrumental in the start of my career, and here we are again. I'm just blessed <laughs> to be sitting on the screen with them to be able to have them to pour into you over the years like they poured into me. So without further ado, I want to uh, reacquaint some of you to our mentor and friend and introduce to others, the one and only Dr. George C. Frazier. Thank you, Brother Bedford. Now let's remember tonight is not about me. It's about the great Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, a longtime friend, <laughs> colleague, mentor in many ways. Um, intellectually curious, a critical thinker with a growth mindset, a master educator and teacher, um, a race man, a brother who is not only woke, but conscious and has committed his life, his time, his talent and his treasure to the upliftment and the investment of his own people. Um, he has an illustrious, probably 10 page bio. We don't have time to read all of his bio, but that would take up all the time of the show. Right? And most importantly are the words and the creative and innovative thoughts that comes out of Dennis's mouth every time I'm around him. Every time we talk, we have a rich conversation. Uh, one of the things I love about Dennis is a small little thing, but the brother laughs easily. <laughs> he has a wonderful sense of humor. A lot of it is uh, self-depreciating humor. He laughs about himself. He laughs about situations. And he applies that humor. They say that you have to be very intelligent to have a good sense of humor, to make find the humor in all things. He, he has that unique quality. One of the things we have in common, other than we are both speakers and authors, is that we were both selected by history makers to be recorded and, and then the recording be put in the Smithsonian or in the Library of Congress, 5,000 um, top black people in the country uh, uh, have been selected for that and that project. Uh, which was initiated by a Harvard graduate, uh, Sister Juliana Richardson, um, has been working on that and has just an, done an incredible job. And she was smart enough to select uh, Dennis. Um, so I went to History Makers and I pulled down his bio. And, you know, with the legends that we have on this All Star podcast, I think it's right, only right, to give them a proper introduction. So I'm going to read to you the short bio that History Makers has up uh, on the World Wide Web. When you go to History Makers and you put a query in for Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, you're going to see a great picture of him and you're going to see a short bio. But most importantly, what you want to do is see the, um, the video interview that they did with Dr. Kimbrough. It's profound. So let me just quickly read it to you. It says, author of Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice, Dr. Dennis Kimbrough was born December 29th, 1950 in Jersey City, New Jersey. In 1972, he received his BA and MA degrees from the University of Oklahoma. He later learned or earned his PhD in political science at Northwestern University, research, researching wealth and poverty in underdeveloped countries. Dr. Kimbrough wrote Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice, as an updating and extension of the work of Napoleon Hill, who wrote the work uh, uh, in 1937. It was a bestseller, Think and Grow Rich, after researching the practices of highly successful people and who left at his death an unfinished manuscript directed towards African Americans. Dr. Kimbrough was commissioned by the Napoleon Hill Foundation to complete the manuscript. It was published in 1991. 
um, and Kimbrough and Hill's book became a number one bestseller for a long period of time. Clients of Dr. Kimbrough's lectures have included General Motors, Walt Disney, Frito Lay, and Wells Fargo. He has appeared on television shows, including uh, The Today Show and CNN's Larry King Live, and publications including Success, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and USA Today. He is listed in Who's Who in Black America and is a, uh, is a recipient of the Dale Carnegie uh, Achievement Award and um, a past director of the Center of Entrepreneurship for Clark at Un Atlanta University, where he still teaches as a full professor at Clark Atlanta University. And in addition, in 1996, he served as one of eight national judges for the prestigious Ernst & Young USA Today Entrepreneur of the Year held in Palm Springs, California. In 2005, Dr. Kimbrough's second edition of What Keeps Me Standing, A Black Grandmother's Guide to Peace, Hope, and Inspiration was released. He is married, lives in Atlanta, and is the father of three daughters. And with three daughters, we are praying for Dr. Kimbrough. I know he had to save money for college. He had to save money for marriages. He might have even had to save some money for divorces. I don't know. But, but you're, you're looking at, he's in his office uh, at home in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was talking prior to the show going live that his office is probably about as big as my house, but that's what I think. <laughs> that kind of stupid money um and uh doc it's good to see you man man i love you. you so much george you are crazy man you blowing the dust off of that you know i'm, the, I'm not into that long glowing the uh, bios uh, curriculum vitae's and everything that that's not me it's just good to be front and center and george what you are doing I mean, for, forget this hour. Let's just focus on what you're doing. It is beyond profound because what I was going to tell you before we went live, okay? Imagine this, in 1989, all right? East Indians here in the United States, they got all the top thinkers. I mean, what you're doing right now, George, not that I would call myself a top thinker, but you know, you're wrapping your mind and you're wrapping you your arms around thinker. folks. You're a top are, thinker. You know, yes. So they got the East Indians here in this country, they got all the top thinkers and they sat down and what did they wanna do? They wanted to find a field that East Indian American children could dominate. And they said after months of deliberation, well, we can't dominate basketball, football, baseball. They got other ethnic groups who are, who are doing that. And we're not gonna go to Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood was started by Jewish Americans and now blah, 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 this, that. So you can forget that field. And uh, man, in terms of uh, engineering and everything, you got German Americans, blah, blah, blah. And then they came up with this idea of, wait a minute, we know one field that we can dominate. And what was the field, George? It's called the spelling bee. Mm. The spelling bee. And you look at the last 19 winners of the spelling bee, 15 have been East Indian children. Right. And now the spelling bee has gone from the spelling bee to the math bee, from the math bee to the science bee. Now, what does that have to do with what you're doing right now? The fact of the matter is we need to continue to get our best thinkers. Again, in all my humble opinion, I'm honored to be on your show, but you go back in 1927 when Charles Lindbergh flew from New York to Paris, he didn't do it to be the first individual to fly across Atlantic. He did it because of the $25,000 prize money that was involved. Yeah. And you had nine other teams who invested a total of 400,000 to win 25,000 because they knew the thinking, what that would do to individuals on a grand scale if one individual raised his or her vision. And it's all about raising your vision. This is the absolute best time in the world. Yeah, I know we got a pandemic. I know you got a virus out there. I thought, you know, I've got, I'm not one to just latch on to the news, CNN, headline news, this, that, and everything. But I try to keep abreast. I know there's more than 20,000 deaths 
They're getting close to a million, you know, uh, positive cases and everything. But this is the best time to be on this planet. That's right. I mean, when you look at the World Health Organization, George, they track 10,000 diseases. Right now, you go to the, you know, the website of the World Health Organization, and they track everything from bloodshot eyes to cancer, from irritable bowel syndrome to shaving bumps. CDC, the you know, Center for Disease Control, which is only 10 miles from my house, they track the top 400. They said, we're not going to follow 10,000. We're just going to follow the top 400. Now, that's the bad news. So what is the good news, George? Of the 10,000 that the World Health Organization tracks and of the 400 that the CDC tracks, not one was created by God. Not one was created by God. So what is the difference between this disease and the truth? George, if I took Brother Bedford and I said, Brother Bedford, come into my room. I'm going to give you a, a, a piece of paper and a pen. And I want you and George, George, I want both you and Brother Bedford to multiply 50 times two. George, you tell me that 50 times two is 100. Brother Bedford, you tell me that 50 times two is 99. What is the difference between the two? The difference, George, you know the truth and Brother Bedford doesn't. So how are we going to find out the truth? What does the Bible say? You've got to work out your own salvation. In other words, figure the damn problem out. And what do we know? We know that 50% of people say, well, okay, Dr. Kim, I'm trying to follow you right now, but why, why does God create that virus? Why did God, God didn't do what you did. Well, okay, there you go. You're off in left field. 50% of disease here in the world is caused by the lack of adequate drinking water. Maybe that's the reason why you were placed on earth to go ahead and dig a well in, you know, in the savannah where all humanity started. Maybe that's the reason why, you know, go dig a well in Bangladesh. Maybe go dig a well in the outskirts of Wuhan, and maybe this would have not even occurred. So when he says, work out your own salvation, doggone it, you figure it out. And it comes down to four keys. And I, I've got to give props to my brother Simon Belly, the, 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 the four questions. Number one, question number, where have you been? What in the world have you been doing? I tell my students all the time, no one in this class is 16 years old. And I'll never forget, I gotta share this story. All right, I'm in the school of business and we had a class and I brought in one of the top financial literacy experts in the country, flew him down from Washington, DC uh, to speak in all of my cohorts. I got three classes and um, you know, he was gonna go ahead and give my students the A through Z of financial literacy, one of the pillars that you so talk eloquently about that you dedicated your life to, George. And my students said, okay, so we got a dress code in the school of business, but we know whenever we have an outside speaker, you want to ramp it up, you want to take it through, and then you want to be a little bit more crisp when other eyes are watching, okay? So I get ready, I go into class, I'm on my way to class, I go into class, I introduce myself to the speaker, make sure he's got the technology, here's the clicker, uh, everything that you need, and blah, blah, blah. And as I'm about to read his bio and introduce him to my students, one of my TAs comes in and says, Dr. Kimber, before you do, come out in the hall. One of, one of your students is out there. One of my TAs blocked my student from coming into class because he wasn't dressed appropriately. As a matter of fact, he was dressed like he just changed the oil in his car. And I didn't get involved. My TA and all my TAs are seniors, and they want their degree to mean something. So they block him. No, you're not coming in. But well, let me see Dr. Kimber. So I went out there and I said, listen, man, you got no problem with me. I'm going to do whatever my TA tells me and blah, blah, blah. And I thought it was the end of the story. No, it wasn't. I gave him a, a case study. They got to analyze case study. So uh, I turned, I gave him the papers back and the kid gets an A. One of my students, he gets an A. Excellent analysis of this business problem, blah, blah, blah. And in his case study, before he wrapped up, he spoke about how I didn't care about him and how I didn't let him in that class because he was really looking forward to that speaker on financial literacy. And he shared his story. If you knew that I came from, you know, Chicago, and if you knew that I'm a product of a single parent, first generation, and I climbed through the mud, and I climbed through the dirt just to get through Clark Atlanta and this, that, and everything, and I said, that's great. That's well and good, and blah, blah, blah. But then I said, do you want to hear my story? 
Okay, my mother had a seventh grade education. My mother was a nanny. She took care of white children, wealthy white. She lived with a wealthy white family. Uh, my father was a butler, excuse me, my grandfather was a butler. My grandmother was made. They worked for a wealthy family in North Carolina before moving to, and then I called my TO, TA over. Now you have a story too, don't you girl? Blah, blah. What is I'm saying? Everybody got a story. Everybody has a story. And George, in all the interviews, mindset, in all the interviews that I had, you know, the hundreds of interviews for what makes the great great and the thinking we're rich a black choice, and even for the wealth choice, there were only two times that I shared my story with the individual who I was interviewing. One was A.G. Gaston, and the other one was Henry Parks. And brother, they went up one side of me and they didn't want to hear my story. A.G. Gaston lit up his pipe when I was trying to say, Dr. Gaston, if you knew what I'm going through, I don't have a dime. I'm in year four or five of doing this nonsense. I think I need to go get a job. I, I think my wife and family, they're going to leave me. And he lit up his pipe and he handed me a Kleenex and he said, yo, man, tell me when you're through. Ain't nobody got time to hear this. No one's respecting me in my community. I lost two cars and blah. And then the second time when I flew to Baltimore and spent the better part of a day with Henry Parks. Henry Parks of Park Sauces, George Dam Frazier. I shared my story. You know what Henry Parks said to me? Mm. He said, young man, in one hand, I have a dream. In the other hand, I have an obstacle. Tell me, which one grabs your attention? In other words, everybody got a story. You can't control that. The only thing you can control where you go from here. Right. And that's mindset. And that's what you're doing for us, George. You're taking folks that where I go from here is the only thing that matters. It's not what you're going through. It's what you're going to. You know, if I... If, if I ask the average individual, okay, um, how would you describe what you do, you know, over the course of the day? Would you call it a job? Would you call it work? Would you call it a career? Or would you call it a mission? I ask them this all the time. Well, if you call it work, if you call it a job, it's going to be very, it's going to be heavy and it's going to be a burden. If you call it a career, it's got an ending point, a beginning point and an ending point. But if you call it a mission, if you call it a mission, you will be completely engaged and you'll never get tired because it will energize you. Thank if you call, and it's one thing to write a mission, it's another thing to live it. If you call it a mission, George Frazier, you forget, man, I didn't get my clothes off the cleaners. Oh my God, George, I gotta get it. I gotta go pick my kids up. Man, I didn't even need today, man. And that's what, and George, we were talking about this early on in the day when you called me. You told me, George Frazier, where are the black leaders? Where are the young black leaders who are mission oriented? Because we have talked about Earl Graves, the nonsense that Earl Graves had to go through, the nonsense that you had to go through, the nonsense that Les Brown had. No one's telling you, come on, Lambs. No one's telling you you gotta you don't go through what Les had to go through, or you had to go what you had to go through. Come on, man. I'm just saying we're not in this world to set it right. We're in this world to see it right. And when you see that the opportunities that you have right now, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I've been blessed. I remember years ago, the first time I interviewed Andy Young and we were, we were in Atlanta. And because of that one interview, he took a liking to me and we have been, we've got a great relationship. And I just love sitting at his feet when he shares and pours into me the stories about Dr. King, man. Mm -hmm. And we were in Florida together four or five, six months ago, whatever. And we were in the hotel and he was on his little scooter and I was in the, in the lobby. I just got through uh, exercising and I knocked down one or two and he came over and I just hugged him and kissed him and told him that I love him. And just me and him sitting there and talking about mindset. And he told me the following story about Martin Luther King that everybody needs to hear. And he said to me, he said, I remember one time we came back from a meeting 
And we went back to Dr. King's hotel room. It was me, Andy Young. It was uh, Andy Young, Hosea Williams, Jesse Jackson, Ralph David Abernathy, C.T. Vivian, and Dr. King. And Dr. King said to us, he said, fellas, he was in a jovial mood. He said, fellas, we got to be out of our damn mind to think that we can change this country. And they would say, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then King said, but I tell you what, if we are lucky enough to change this country, no one seated around this table will live to see age 40. He said, that's the bad news. He said, the good news is just think of the untold opportunities that generations upon a generation will benefit from because of the work that we are doing here today. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody Jonathan live a seagull. The only reason why you can see as far as you can because we stand on some broad shoulder. Again, George, getting back to what you are doing right now. So number one, tell me where you've been. Where have you been? Number two, tell me why you're here. I mean, what is the greatest tragedy in life? The greatest tragedy in life is not death. The greatest tragedy in life is to be alive and damn it, not know why. Not know why. Why are you here, man? You're here to complete the noble task, man. That's why you're here. Just the fact that you are here means all the lights are green. All the stops have been pulled out. All the roadblocks are gone. If you were born, the reason why you were born in 1850, they weren't ready for you yet. They weren't ready for you. Imagine this. Imagine if Steve Jobs was born in 1850. He'd probably commit suicide, man. What a waste. That would have yeah. been. Yeah. Trying to explain, you know, man, I need to, uh uh, bro. So, number two, why are you here? Number three, what can you do? And again, it goes back to what makes the great great. What is your area of excellence? Right, right. Now, here we are with the pandemic, and I was on a podcast. But Kimberly, tell us, I mean, people sitting in the homes and everything, and they're just twiddling their thumbs. Well, don't be twiddling the thumbs. I mean, I go back to when I was in Cleveland in 1983. I flew up to Cleveland, spent a day with the fight promoter, Don King. I was in your neighborhood. And Don King said, come on up, man. You want to come interview me? Come on up. And you can just follow me as I walk through the neighborhood and I go about my business and blah, blah, blah. And I asked Don King, I said, when you served those eight years, when you were in that penitentiary in Marion, Ohio, for eight years for manslaughter, what did you do? He said, before he walked through the front gates, George, he said, I was determined to make this time serve me. I wasn't going to serve this time. Mm. He read every book in the prison library. Mm. So number one, I'm on the pad podcast and I'm telling the listeners, you got to learn, you got to relearn, and you got to unlearn. Dennis, that's a, that's a wonderful, what you just said is a wonderful way to look at COVID-19. Yeah. So yeah, here we are stuck in our homes for six to eight weeks. Make the time work for you. Don't do the time. Yes. Make the time work for you. That's, that's, a, that's a beautiful insight. Yes. So, you know, I mean, like I said, learn, relearn, and unlearn. Number two, now's the time to start a new habit. They said it only takes 21 days to get a habit. Uh, you want to stop drinking? Stop drinking. Do cool. you want to stop smoking? Stop smoking. If you're a bit, you know, if you're a business owner, now is the time for you to think. Well, yeah, I'm a business owner and I'm doing okay, and blah blah blah, and I'm weathering the storm. But let's start thinking of okay, what is what is like? People gonna say, well, what's gonna be the new normal? Well, we gotta think bigger than that. We gotta think beyond that. What is what is the life gonna look like? What is the world gonna look like beyond Google, beyond Facebook? It's going to be digitized. So you got to think, don't think monetized. You better think digitized. You got to think like Blockbuster. What is Netflix? Netflix is Blockbuster digitized. Okay. You got to think, what, what is Zoom? Zoom is the office meeting digitized. I mean, that's where we got to go in our thinking because now, okay, as, as I shared with you, I might have shared with somebody else, when you go on your smartphone as soon as you click your smartphone there are 3.2 billion people online with you but george in six years or less you know we're going to ramp that 3.2 billion up to 8 billion everybody will have access to a smartphone so if you're an entrepreneur 
That means 8 billion set of eyes, 8 billion set of ears for you to go ahead and share your idea and share your program. You go back to the turn of the century, 2000. If you wanted to launch a new startup in Silicon Valley, George, it cost you minimum, minimum $5 million to launch a startup in Silicon Valley. Right. Do you know what it costs now? $5,000, thanks in part to crowdfunding. And what do we know about crowdfunding? The crowd doesn't care about your color. The crowd doesn't care about your race. The crowd doesn't care about your gender. The crowd doesn't care about your story. The only thing the crowd cares about, your idea, your vision. Right. In this day and age, man. So what else should I do? I mean, if you don't know, you know, my wife got a new Mac, um, you know, a new um, laptop and this, that, and everything, and she's trying to figure out and going to Google, blah, blah, blah. I said, Pat, that's a great thing. All you need to do is hang around your grandkids. So if you're old farts, and I'm an old fart, I'm not talking about you, George. I'm know. walking distance to age 70. Oh, I mean, geez. if you want to find out what's going on technology, like, go ask the young folks. Go ask the millennials, man. So, I mean, those are three things that you can do right now so that when they do cut the light switch on, you're ready, you're focused, and you're good to go. And then the last question, okay, what can I do? Find your area of excellence. The last question, where am I going? Yeah. Where am I going? Where am I going? Mm -hmm. What is the vision? I mean, what can, you know, what is my mission in life? What is my purpose in life? Why am I here? And if you knew the small, thin thread, George, this whole Easter weekend that just went by holds special meaning for me. Unbelievable special meaning. Because it was on Good Friday that Harvey McKay called me up. He got a copy of an article that I had in Success Magazine. And I got that article on a billboard in the other uh, part of my study that he was in between flights and he stops by a new stand to get a magazine to read on the flight. And he picks up Success Magazine and he saw the article in there that Success Magazine wanted me to write. And at the end of it, Dennis Kimbrough, forthcoming author of um, Blacks Are Growing Rich with the Napoleon Hill Foundation, blah, blah, blah. And he called me up that, that Good Friday and he said, I read your article. And here's the thing, George. When people want to get a hold of you, they'll find your number. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You, no you hear that would-be entrepreneur? I didn't give them a number. I didn't even know who it was. There was no caller ID. I just picked up the phone. I didn't know who it was. When people want to get W. Clement Stone calling me, when people want to get a hold of you, they will get you a number. When you're serious, when you are serious about being serious, You'll go ahead and do what you, whatever you got to do. Okay. So he called me up and he said, um, uh, have you shared your manuscript? I said, no. As a matter of fact, I got it right here. I was thinking about sending it to a few. He said, no, don't do that. He said, can I see it? And I covered the phone and I turned to my wife and I said, Pat, I want to see my manuscript. And she said, go ahead, Vince, go ahead, talk, talk, talk. And I said, okay. And he said, do me a big favor. Here's my address. Overnight it to me. He said, if I think, you know, based on this article that I think it's going to be, I'm going to share it with my agent and you never know. And he said, just do me one big favor. Give me 48 hours to get back to you. And I said, okay, don't share it with anybody else. And he hung up. Well, after he hung up, I turned to my wife and I said, Pat, 48 hours is Easter Sunday. This man ain't going to call me Easter Sunday. Sure enough, George, three o'clock, me and my wife upstairs sitting on that deck. The phone rang at three o'clock Easter Sunday. He was bouncing off the ceiling. Young man, do you know what you have written? And I said, I guess, yeah. He said, no, do you really know? He said, I have shared this with my agent and come Monday morning, tomorrow morning, that my agent is going to send this out for bid for the top 12 publishing houses in the nation. Mm. The rest was it's history. history. The mm. rest was history. Now, Am I saying that to impress anybody? No, I was on a mission. That's all I did. That, that was my job. And just like you're on a mission, George, and that's what we need, Black America. We need that, man. 
We Great need that. Come on, man. We, we, we need folks. Listen, I'm tired of looking at the data. I'm, 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 I'm just tired of 34 million African Americans and half of my race, soon as they wake up in the morning, they are a day's march from poverty, man. <laughs> I'm tired of it. That's right. Half of my race, soon as we wake up in the morning, we are half of we are in survival mode. Come on, man. We <laughs> got to get our best thinkers, man. Got to do it. And George, you got to find a way. Okay, so you got these thinkers and everything. You got to go get another set of thinkers, and you got to raise the capital. And we got to look at the top three or five questions, challenges, problems facing Black America. Mm -hmm. and offer a cash prize to anybody who can solve them. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Two things. Uh, it was a great Black, the French philosopher, Franz Fanon, mm -hmm. who said this. Got his book back it, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, these are the three most important questions that you must answer in life. Mm -hmm. Who am I? Why do I exist? And am I all that I am capable of being? Mm -hmm. And you will spend your life answering those questions. And that you cannot, and this is a fallacy, you cannot be anything that you want to be. You cannot, mm -hmm. no, you cannot. You can be at the highest levels, that which God has assigned you. So let me give you an example. Michael Jordan, the baddest basketball player to have ever played basketball. He really wanted to play baseball. So he quit basketball. But that was not the assignment that God gave Michael. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't play basketball right. as awesome as an athlete as he was. He could play basketball. Yep. Now, Michael also wanted to coach basketball. Mm -hmm. But he had to end up firing himself as a coach of his own team. Yep. That he but Phil Jackson, who was a moderately good basketball player, has 10 rings for coaching. Yep. God wanted Phil Jackson to coach. God wanted Michael Jordan to play basketball, not play baseball. So the job that we have is to find what God wants mm -hmm. us to do, to be inspired by that thing. Now, that's easier said than done. And that's a big part of our search for meaning, our search for life. It was Joseph Campbell, and I'm finished with this because this is about you, but but you inspire me. You, you, mm -hmm. you really do. Joseph Campbell said that life has no meaning. Each of us has meaning and we bring it to life. And it is a waste of time to be asking the question when you are the answer. Yes. Yes. Right? Life has no meaning. You have meaning. What is that meaning? And you bring that to life, right? And the stories you have written about, the greats, bring that to light for us mm -hmm. on how they brought their own personal vision to life, their own personal meaning. And so things are written about them and said about them to this day. So I wanna ask you a question. I'm gonna phrase it with a statement. We are all digging or drinking from wells that we did not dig. We are yeah. all drinking from wells that we did not dig, that we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we worthy of that legacy? A 250 year fight for civil rights, voting rights and public access, 12 generations. And we read about and see movies about those who established that legacy for us. Yeah. Then the second big legacy is the fight for civil rights, voting rights, and public access. That took 100 years, five generations, and ended with the baby boomers. And we read about 
those who sacrificed and died and worked hard. You talked about Dr. King and Andy Young, and we read about them to this day. That's a legacy. So the question then is if we are worthy of those legacies, Dennis, the question I ask generation X, Y, Z, and generation alpha, the children of millennials, what will be your legacy? What will our children's 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 children be saying about you 150 years from now? So that's my question. Do you have any clue mm -hmm. on what succeeding generations legacy what legacies are they working on is it black lives matter is it hip-hop what is that legacy in your opinion you 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 touched on it a bit right in the beginning you, you started talking about young people mm -hmm. we are leaving a legacy mm -hmm. you are part of that civil rights voting rights public access movement mm -hmm. you are around young people what are they working on that would be legendary and legacy leaving? Or is it just too early to tell? Just, uh, just your thoughts. You're, you're, you're a critical. Well, person. I think, yeah, that, 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 that is a great question. And that's a great, you know, the way that you wrapped it up. Um, I think uh, there are some millions of young folks doing exciting things and everything. But collectively, I mean, the, the jury is out until the baton has been passed and they finish running that race. They're in the process of running that race. But here's the thing that, that excites me, you know, what we can do to help shape them. And, you know, I tell my students all the time, if you're weak, I'll show you a way to get strong. If you're slow, I can help you get fast. But the one thing I can't do, I can't drag you across the finish line. You got to do that for yourself. So the bottom line is, you know, I try to be as Socratic in my effort as I can in terms of asking questions that will get them thinking. You know, I shared this with you before, and, um, and, and, and certainly it's worth mentioning again. Before Nelson Mandela died, um, he was about to make his transition, and a journalist asked him one last question. He said, Mr. Mandela, I've got to ask you, you've had a glorious life, but what is the purpose of life? And then Mandela said, the only way I can answer your question is to ask you two questions. He said, question number one, have you moved from fear to fearless? And number two, with regard to your life, have you closed the gap between your potential and your performance? So I ask my students questions that'll help them shape the future and where they're going. Question number one, we, you wanna be an entrepreneur? What do entrepreneurs do? Entrepreneurs solve problems, George. So here's my question. If I gave you a million dollars, if I gave you a million dollars, young man, young lady, what problem would you solve? If I gave you a billion dollars, what problem would you solve? When it's all said and done, second question, when it's all said and done, what will others say about you? And then I like to really go off on a tangent. If you were a media brand, would you be CNN or would you be Discovery Channel? If you were a uh, cell phone, would you be iPhone or would you be Android? If you were a box of Cracker Jacks, what would be your free prize inside? Mm. What's the one gift that people aren't expecting, but when you share it, it blows them away? Mm. Because that all comes back to service and it's not so much service, it's how you do it. What are you doing with your life? And I, and I saw so many examples of that. I shared um, on numerous occasions, um, Maynard Jackson. And Maynard Jackson, just like you said with Michael Jordan, he wanted to play baseball, but the Lord didn't have that in mind. He said, man, go shoot that 25-footer with three seconds on the clock. That's what I had in mind for you. That's right. That's right. Well, it's the same thing with Maynard Jackson. I mean, Maynard Jackson's claim to fame was not to be the mayor of Atlanta. His claim to fame was, this is my vision of an airport. An airport should be a shopping mall where people can catch a flight. And because he came up with that vision, think of all the other airports across the globe came up with that vision. That's right. And then I saw it again. I saw it again with Janetta Cole when she was the first black female president of Spelman College. 
I mean, she has, uh, you know, Maya Angelou and she has Oprah Winfrey and she, and, uh, she says, uh, ladies, I wanna, uh, I wanna walk you down my campus because I have something real interesting to show you. So, you know, on separate occasions, they're walking down her campus and she says, uh, in the, you know, at the end of the campus, she says, this is what I wanna show you. And both of them said, what are, what are, what are you talking about, Janetta? We're looking at a, a, a pile of dirt and some bricks. And she said, yeah, this is, this is what I wanna show you right here. This is a pile of dirt and bricks. She says, this is where I'm gonna bend my STEM Academy for my young ladies at Spelman. They're gonna do robotics, STEM search, research the science, technology, and blah, blah, blah. George, that was in 1997 that she shared that vision. That was more than 20 years ago. Who heard of more than 20 years ago, the word STEM? STEM right. And what do we know about a STEM cell? The STEM cell is the energizer cell in your body. The STEM cell fights disease and fights aging. She said, this is where my building is gonna be. And you look at all the young ladies at Stoneman College coming through there and now they're physicians across the country. You know, what, can, what do you see that others don't? There are two books. One is a book and one is a short story that all the top business schools make sure that their students read. And good mind, when I uh, teach at the MBA level, they certainly got to read this. One is called The Go-Getter by Peter Kine. Mm -hmm. That was published in the early 1900s, helped this country get through its first depression. It talks about the power of persistence long before, and I have her book right here, Angela Duck worked on grit. Peter Kime was all about persistence and we know what persistence is. It's the level of belief in yourself. When you hit that roadblock, when you hit failure, the critical questions that you've got to ask yourself, okay, what did I learn? Okay, what do I have to do? Okay, let's move on and do it. And then the other is a short story by H.G. Wells. And that short story is Country of the Blind. And what is Country of the Blind? It's a story about an explorer and he's on this island and he is the only one that has eyes and everybody else on this island through some deformity, they were born without these ocular mounds on their head. And he's trying to explain sight. George, as an entrepreneur, you go through that all the time. You're trying to explain your vision. Who is the most dangerous individual in the room? The man or woman with sight with no vision, who was the most hopeless individual in the room? Any man or woman without hope. <laughs> You've done that in your entire life. I would like to be a fly in the wall going back 20 something, whatever. I don't know how far we got to go back. When you try to explain your networking conference, oh, I'd like to be there. <laughs> I'd like to hear you get all. <laughs> It, it took me two years to explain it to the group that I needed to, to help. Right. You're right. Yeah. That's that, that, that's deep. Let me ask you a question. This is just so fascinating. We could spend hours talking to you. What useful advice, Dennis, would you offer your 15 year old self to pave the way for the future? Wow. That, you know what? <laughs> um, wow. I guess it comes down to one word, what I have right over there. My wife bought that for me years ago. It's the word believe. The word believe. You know, um, oh man. If I had a, a glass of water, and you heard me say this before, George, if I had a glass of water and I took it into a chemistry class and I asked, say, it down to its finest components, I get two part hydrogen, one part oxygen. Well, if I took the Bible into that same chemistry class and I want to, I don't have time to read all 66 books. I don't have the time to read all 40 some odd, you know, authors and everything. Just tell me what I need to know. Assay it down to its finest components. Number one is believe. And number two is be not afraid. That's all we need. There's only four things in life you need, George. Something to do, something to believe in, something to hope, and someone to love. That is it. And that's not me. That's no Ralph Waldo Emerson. That's not me. That's Henry David Thoreau. Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. That's all you need. Yeah. Believe, 
and be not afraid. Dennis, 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 uh, this is this is great. Um, how do you handle being outside of your comfort zone? <laughs> Well, that, 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 that's where life begins, man. Yeah. yeah. How do you, that, that's that's how do you where life it? begins. Yep. I tell my students all the time, if your heart is not in your throat at least once a week, you're living too close to the edge. <laughs> you are living too close to the edge. And where's the worst place in life that you could ever be? And that is in your comfort zone. That is in your comfort zone. That's where I was that going, Dad. To, I was going. That's right. That, <laughs> And that's not me, that's Steve Jobs, man. Steve Jobs, you know, they asked Steve Jobs, they said, you know, um, how come you don't hire B-level people? And he said, I, I hire B-level people. I just wait to become A-level folks. And then I hire them. He said, no, but how come, no, really, Steve, how come you won't hire a B person? He said, the reason why I won't hire a B person, because if I hire that B person, sooner or later, that B person might feel sorry for a C person. And then they're in the organization and the whole organization goes to hell. I need people who have done things with their life. I need people that, you know, are, are certain in uncertain times, who are comfortable with uncertainty. And that's what you see. That's the mindset out in Silicon Valley. Don't you know, George, if you go to Google, if you go to Deutsche Bank, if you go to a couple of other businesses out in Silicon Valley, they got meditation rooms. They got rooms where you can go there and just decompress. Why? Because you're on the grind 24-7 out there thinking of the next best thing. Thinking how I can do better, faster, cheaper, be more efficient, more effective. You know, because it all goes back to market. Anybody can wow the customer. Anybody can do more than what is expected, more than what is required. And if, you are, if you're doing the same thing, the same way it's always done, not all the time, but chances are not all the time, it's being done the wrong way. It's being done the wrong way. Anything can be differentiated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the way that the world is changing so flat, we don't even live, live in a linear world anymore. What the hell do you mean linear? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No, we live in an exponential world right now. One, two, right. four, eight, 16, 32, 64, you know, 128, 256. Because that's the way change is going on. You will either change or you're going to be changed by change. It's moving so fast. That's right. I mean, you think of you think of Uber. Uber didn't come to me and say, you know, I'm thinking about starting a, uh, you know, a uh, taxi cab business, but I won't own the cars. Uh, the people will own the cars and blah, blah, blah. And what's going to make this business so special um, in this phone, I'm going to let the, you know, the passenger that passenger is going to be the center of gravity and the passenger will be able to go ahead and rate the ride and based on how many stars they get, this, that, and another one. Well, hey, man, that's great, man. And look at Uber now. Ooh, don't you know, and it goes back to mindset, George, the number one group in terms of depression in New York are yellow cab taxi cab drivers trying to pay off that medallion. That's true. Look at the suicide rate. That's right. Right. I mean, Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, his business has gone belly up because that's all he did. He sold medallions to yellow cab drivers. Now, knowing that the industry is gone, man. I mean, you think of, uh, you know, you, you think of uh, Google Maps, man. Google Maps, how to get the point A, point B. But then here comes Waze, and Waze takes the same idea of Google Maps, MapQuest, and George always did change one algorithm. That's mm. all they did, a single algorithm. Yeah, we're like MapQuest, we can get you point A, point B, but Waze, we can get you point A, point B, the fastest and the safest. Yeah. <laughs> now you got stock in the MapQuest, blah, 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 and it's game over, brother. That's yeah. exponential thinking, and that's where we need to be. Dennis, tell me a, just a quick story of a fear, a personal fear that you had and how you overcame it? Wow. Um, that, that's an easy question yeah, for me. That goes answer. back. When I, know I, you're, I know you're fearless. I know you're fearless. So no, you not hardly, bro. <laughs> and, um, and I had to uh, let go of the corporate job. And people have heard me share this story. I was a pharmaceutical sales rep 
And when I was going around interviewing all those folks and out of that interview came three books, um, I was working on my first book, What Makes the Great Great. And um, I was a pharmaceutical sales rep and I just made uh, calls and I was a hospital rep. So I was just calling on infectious disease and this, that and everything. So George, I was in a territory near my house and it was like maybe one o'clock, 1.30. And I said to myself, and I was stealing time, not stealing time, I was taking vacation days and sick days to go interview folks for my, for my writings while I was still working in corporate. Well, it was about lunchtime and I said, do I wanna go to McDonald's or do I wanna go buy the house and maybe eat leftovers from blah, blah, blah. I said, I'll go buy the house. Well, while I'm home, the phone rings and it was John Johnson of Ebony Magazine. Mm. <laughs> there was no caller ID. I didn't know who it was. I just happened to pick up the phone. Young man, I received your letter. Now, what's this about you wanting to interview me? George, if I wasn't home, I would have missed it. And there's no telling how many phone calls I missed. So me and my lovely wife, we had a uh, come to Jesus. And I said, Pat, I said, I'm ready to leave. And um, we're just going to, if you don't mind, and she said, how long is it going to take? And I said, not a day past 18 months, a year and a half. Well, I had already, I had already put in two and a half years, and it took me close to another five, total of seven. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that is the centerpiece. Now, I just share that story. I don't know what it's going to take for you. It took me seven years. I was a knucklehead at, at the beginning of it. I was, um, I was Mr. PhD. I was full of myself. I had a lot of ego and this, that, never don't have that anymore. Again, it goes to mindset, health set, soul set, heart set. And what is heart set? Less me, more we. What is heart set? Less ego, more humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's what people see. People say to me all the time, Dr. Kimbrough, are you, I, I don't see you on Instagram and I don't see you. Dr. Kimbrough, when, when are you going to raise your, you know, your, your, your digital presence and your blah, 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 blah. I'm going to do that. But, you know, George, I have no problem saying, you know, that just kind of everybody's best selling all over. Everybody saw it after business speaker and this. That's not, I'm not knocking it, George. I'm not knocking it. I'm not knocking you. Know, but, man, I tell people all the time, I did not get in this business to speak. I got in this business to write, man. This is what I do. Let me stay in my swim lane. Maybe years from now, when me and you are on a fluffy couch reading our business and econ books up in the sky, having this another digital conversation, right. somebody's down here and they're reading our books and they'll say, where's this been? George, I walk up and down the campus and I got students coming up to me. That's Kimberly, man, your book, man, is unbelievable, man. Oh, man, I can't believe it, man. What is it, a year old, two years? I said, man, the book's older than you, man. You kidding, man, were you? Yep. Yep. Untold generation. And I got to share this because you got folks out there, right? Napoleon Hill wrote Thinking for Rich 1937, okay? He wrote 16 books. Mine was the, the book that he was working on that was given to me. And I have, you look right back there in that folder back there, and I'm in my study, are the last 100 written pages from Napoleon Hill. If I pulled that out and show you, that would have been book 17. But to me, his best book that he wrote is this book right here. It's called The Master Key to Riches. Right mm -hmm. there, The Master Key to riches. Why? Because he didn't lean on any interviews that he had in there. He's telling the readers what is true success. Yeah. I can read that book and I can read Covey and I can read Jim Collins' Good to Great and I can read Marcus Buckingham and uh, all the others and I can tell you where they pulled stuff out of this book. I can tell it, man. I can tell it. Yeah. No one creates anything. We just take it and just give our little blah, blah, blah. But it was Hill that came up to what is true success? True success is a six-pointed star that you can judge and gauge by the number of stars that you've incorporated in life. And it begins with peace of mind. It begins with peace of mind. That's all it is. Success is people. It's not a dollar figure. 
It's the absence of all negative emotions, fear, anger, jealousy, hatred, guilt, greed. And he says that the greatest of this, and he'll call, he says, love is an emancipator. It's an emancipator. It frees us. He came up with 17 principles for success in Think and Grow Rich. Number one, definiteness of purpose. Number two, mastermind. Number three, applied faith. Number four, going the extra mile. The only reason why he came up with number five, pleasing personality to number 17, cosmic happen for happenstance, is to get you to focus on the first four. Mm -hmm. Definiteness on purpose. What are you going to do? And you better pray. You better pray that it is a burning desire. You better pray it's a burning desire because that leads to the passionate, committed mind and the passionate, committed mind can never be defeated. Yes. Woo. We are now turning the corner here. So we have a lightning round. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you some, I'm going to ask you some questions. You got to give answers under 15 seconds. Okay. 15 <laughs> Now, so if, you said, back, if you if you were to die and come back as a person or a thing, what do you think it would be? I would come back maybe as a preacher. Yes. Clergy member. I can see that. Maybe. <laughs> Amen. What yeah. is your most treasured possession? My most treasured possession? My family. Yeah. Amen. Yep. Where would you that, love? Uh, that, that is my why. That is yeah. my why. The, 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 the Bible says man and women cannot live by bread alone. Well, what right. in the world does that mean? That means you better have a why, brother. And on that wall right there, we were in Barbados, my entire family. That is my why. There you go. I mean, you you know, get... Yeah. And I know yeah, you're you doing the light and round and this, that, and everything. But you go back to Richard Branson, all right? Richard right. Branson, as you know, two years ago, he gave up the leadership, the CEO position, day-to-day -day operations of Branson Enterprises. Branson, uh, you know, Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Airlines, this, that, and everything. So a journalist goes up to him and says, Mr. Branson, now that you no longer run the day-to-day -day operations of your affairs, how do you want to be judged? And he said, Branson said, you know, I'm not into judging, man. I'm not into that judging stuff. But if you do have to judge me, don't judge me by anything that I've built, you know, in terms of Virgin Atlantic or Virgin Enterprises, judge me by the character and integrity of my children. There, there you go. Uh, where would you love to live other than Atlanta? Oh, wow. Probably someplace back in Oklahoma or Texas, or maybe, maybe uh East Africa or Western Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. What is the quality that you like most in a man, woman, and friends? The quality that you like on a man, woman, and friends? Integrity. Mm -hmm. Integrity. 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 Yep. Be the so same person. Value. What do you value most in your friends? Yeah, that's yeah. Character and integrity. Be the same person behind the screen that you are in front of the screen. Right. Who's your favorite writer? Ooh, I got um, I got Why a number of them, but outside of, uh, I like Orison Sweat Martin. Orison Sweat Martin, he was the writer who, when Napoleon Hill was a young man, he read his books for growth and development. I see. And I got to share this with you. I'm probably the last, uh, Orison Sweat Martin had two daughters. And Success Magazine set up the interview where I got a chance to interview his last living survivor, his youngest daughter. Mm -hmm. And it was a great interview. And um, he wrote 110 books and pamphlets. And in my personal study in the back room right there, I, I might have outside of W. Clement Stone and a few other folks, the largest collection of his books. Wow. Yeah. Uh, my favorite writer is James, Ball, James Baldwin and... Uh, oh, Howard yes, Thurman. got all his stuff, Fire yeah. Next Time, yeah. yep. Of course, and Howard Thurman. Um, and finally, got all of Howard Thurman's books. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Who, uh, who is your favorite hero? I got to tell you this, I'll, I'll get to my favorite hero, uh, which will be my father. But you mentioned Howard Thurman, my favorite Howard Thurman story. He got um, invited 
to uh, uh, deliver a sermon at a church. And for one hour, he stood in the pulpit and all he did was read the Beatitudes. Is that right? Yep, <laughs> but that he, was his he had a wonderful voice, though, and a wonderful oh, yes. cadence, right? Oh, Magnificent. yes. Magnificent. And, and, and this is the final question. What is your favorite curse word? No. <laughs> Probably damn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, you are marvelous. And yes, you are marvelous. Yeah. And um, what uh, what a what a tour you took us took us on tonight. I don't know who wound you up. Uh, this afternoon, but uh, you are energy personified. You are you about 70? Are you 70 years old? I will be 70 December 29th, 1950. Yeah, I mean, I was born 1950, but I'll be, I'll be uh, 70 December 29th. Yep, I'm 69. Okay, so you, mm -hmm. are, you are an esteemed elder. <laughs> yep. It has been an honor to have you on our All Star Power Network, uh, not, uh, Power, uh, Power Podcast. Um, and of course, I will be seeing you on the EbonyCon, right? That's in, there you go, EbonyCon with uh, Dennis Kimbrough and uh, looking forward to that as well. Um, thank your beautiful family, beautiful wife for yes. allowing you uh, uh, to spend an hour with us. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that wherever they are in the house, if, if anyone's in the house, uh, they could hear you talking, yes. <laughs> Um, um, and so it was just really, really great. Any, any, any final uh, comments or anything you want to say, Brother Bedford? Yeah. Oh, Brother Bedford, go ahead. Brother Bedford, Brother Bedford, and, and then you. Okay. Well, well, look, I, George, I don't know what to say. I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm blessed uh, again to, to be able to start my career and journey with you two whispering in my ears years ago, mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. now just to be able to sit here uh, in the between you two and just listen and absorb the information. I just feel blessed. And I'm just hoping that the energy that Dr. Kimbrough shared throughout the entire interview, yeah. that everyone felt it because I felt it, the passion yeah. of doing this work, of educating and helping to uplift our people. Um, that's why I love that you two are my mentors and I couldn't have asked for two better mentors on the planet. So again, I'm just Thank in awe. Those are my final words. I want to hear right. you all. Uh, well, Dr. my fi my final word is to George Frazier. George, you are the second coming of Marcus Garvey. And to the listeners out there, you need to write this quote down. What did Garvey say? I'll show you what wealth can do. I'll show you what race can do. But most importantly, I'll show you what wealth and race can do together. And yeah. George, that's what you bring to bear in any audience, any corner, wherever you go. And that's what I love you for. God bless you. God bless you. And to our audience, we had a massive audience tonight. We're going to get thousands and thousands of views of this, Dr. Kimbrough. We have been live streaming out on three different platforms tonight. It's the first time we've done it with our podcast. And so um, you've got a massive audience out there. So to our audience out there, um, uh, you will join us hopefully at the Power Networking Conference July 8th through the 11th. Yes, we might have to move it. We'll see what all this looks like come July. But bottom line, we are going to have a Power Networking Conference and Forbes named us one of the top five conferences in America not to be missed. Uh, so we're going to make you our, our, uh, you know, our regular podcast offer. Um, and it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's a special offer for those of us who, uh, and those of you that were smart enough to join us tonight. Um, it is limited. It's a limited time. You have until midnight, and it's a limited number of people. It's only five people that can take advantage of this offer because it's a crazy offer. And why is it a crazy offer? Because I'm crazy, okay? Um, so here's the offer. Uh, I explained it before, but I'm going to explain it again for all of those you, of you on new platforms who are joining us. Uh, to attend the Power Networking Conference, which Forbes named one of the top five conferences in America, not to be missed, right? Not one of the top five Black conferences, but one of the top five of all conferences produced in this country. Um, uh, Dr. Dennis Kimbrough has blessed our 
uh, uh, stage on many occasions. He'll be back. We're going to have a 20th anniversary uh, in 2021, and we're going to have Dr. Uh, Kimbrough back. But um, so an, uh, uh, an adult registration is $1,500. Uh, if you met one person that could help change the trajectory of your life, would that be worth $1,500? Yes, you'll meet more than one. We encourage all of our adults to bring a young person to sit at the feet of masters, right? We should not be conferencing, especially when it comes to business and money and psychological and physical wellness, because those are the only categories that we, we cover. Our young people need to sit at the feet of masters like a Dr. Dennis Kimbrough. So, uh, a student registration is $800. So you put those two together, that's $2,300. We're going to reduce it by $1,900. And we're going to give you a student and an adult for $399. It's limited to the first five people. It will be time stamped and you have until midnight. Okay. It won't take that long. And here's how you get it. You simply have to email me because if you can go on the power networking conference.com website but you're not going to get this deal you have to email me at gfraser at frasernet.com that's gfraser at frasernet.com f-r-a-s is in sam e-r gfraser at frasernet.com say i'm in put your name and your cell number and guess what i'm going to call you not one of my six assistants, I'm going to call you. And I'm going to take your temperature. So that's the offer. That's, uh, that's what it is. Take advantage of it. Um, Dr. Kimbrough, I love you. I love you more, my brother. You are straight, no chaser. <laughs> 100. <laughs> You keep it real and you make it easy to understand and easy to digest. And I can feel your energy coming <laughs> that screen and everybody you were talking to tonight would be <laughs> has felt the same. So God bless you. Thank you so much. We'll be together again in a couple of weeks. Love you, man. Love you too. Go All on. right, Brother Bedford, hey, what's up? Him, bro, before Bedford, you yeah. go, just last thing, can you tell people how to get in touch with you and to get more information from you before we Oh, start? yes. Uh, go to my website, www.denniskimbrough.com. Uh, hit me up on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I am an open book. And if you can't get me that way, just contact any of my students. They got my cell phone number. <laughs> and I have 50 million of them. And here it is. Oh, look, look, look at it, bro. Look at it. So, <laughs> we all, man. Awesome. I love you, man. Take care. Love you, too. Appreciate Thank you. Okay. Appreciate you. God bless you, man. Thank, Thank you. you Bedford. Thank you, George. Take care, everyone. Talk soon. Good night.